since the time that I started working with this next concept, 10 things they don't teach you in alcohol rehab. Now this, this was a, I've been doing this for about five or six years, and I haven't lost a patient yet, which is amazing, because usually in alcohol, drug rehabs, you, you tend to get one or two that just keep continuing. I haven't had a patient yet, because these are very powerful. Number 10 is life as a random generator, the one we just went through. But what I'd like to do is go through some of these other ones, because when you have somebody who comes in with um, alcohol problems, or again, the big thing now is opiates, mm -hmm. you know, they're coming in with the opiate problems, you need to give them something. And rehab just doesn't give them what they need. Rehab just doesn't give them what they need. For example, the first thing I tell them is relapse will occur accidentally sometimes. That, you know, alcohol rehab or drug rehab will help work with you on that situation where you're, you need to go buy a bottle or you want to go buy a bottle and you'll get in the car and you'll drive down to the alcohol store and you'll get out of the car and you'll go pay. They can cut that back. They can get rid of that in alcohol rehab. What they can't get rid of is the accidental. So they don't talk about it. What do I mean by accidentally? You get on a plane, you got moved up to uh, first class, you're sitting down, the stewardess comes over with a glass of white wine, puts it in your hand, and you start drinking normally. You just, you don't even think about it. That's accidental. My favorite story was, it was a guy I'm seeing now. Um, and what he did, <laughs> he was the cookie girl for AA. You know, AA, they have uh, different meetings, have different rules. And they had one guy assigned to cookies. And for years and years, it was this female, so they call it the cookie girl. So he was the cookie girl for AA. So he was going to buy cookies for AA Christmas time last year. And there was a, uh, he turned the corner of one of the aisles, and there was a female, big tall female, blonde, in a short skirt, green outfit, who gave him a glass of beer. And she said, try Anakin for Christmas. And he said, I'm the cookie girl. <laughs> said, but that's accidental. That's just what happens. You know, what do you do in that situation? If you warn people that it happens accidentally, it won't be a surprise when it actually happens. I happened to have talked to him about this two weeks in advance, and he was able to stop himself from drinking. Most people just drink it. It's, it's there. Your normal habit is to go like that. Then they go, oh shit, I relapsed now. I might as well go party. If you give these to people, I give them one a week. One that keeps me working with a person for at least 10 weeks, which, which I can really get some change in them two and a half months. I give them one a week. Let them talk about what's going on in their life, and then we go into this, and again, usually it's the first, last 15 minutes, then it becomes the last half hour. What happens after relapse is the most important thing. You generally expect a little relapse. Generally expect one relapse. What happens after the relapse is the most important thing. If we can shorten the time after a relapse by telling them this, that'll make a biggest difference in their life. If we can shorten the time. You have any comments on these? No? Um, environmental feelings lead to relapse. Anybody play ball, football? They, they probably didn't have grass back then, Rocky, so. <laughs> no, mask. 
No mask. There was a thing about August football and the cut grass. You just smelt it, you felt it, and even to this day, I basically get that feeling to play football in August with the cut grass because you'd have two-a-day practices, and that was sort of your life for those two weeks a year. That's an environmental feeling. That's an environmental feeling. <coughs> However, with our cops, they have a similar thing with cut grass playing around a golf. Because they always drank when they were playing around a golf. They always drank. And they sit there and say, you know, I had a real hard time when I was playing golf. I had a real hard time not wanting to drink. Environmental feelings can lead to relapse. We had a person over in uh, Palm Springs. She, they have a vacation home in Palm Springs. And she said, you know, for some reason I, I was making a guacamole dip and the air was coming from the outside and it felt so good and I'm breathing in and I just, I felt like drinking. She said, I hadn't felt like drinking in the longest time and I just felt like drinking. It was an environmental feeling. She just felt like drinking. Fortunately, again, I had gone through this. She said, I just recognized that's what it was. She said, I had wine right there and I was able to turn, my, turn it away. She was a wine addict. Environmental feelings can lead to relapse. Obsession and depression are part of alcoholism. And this is more for the younger psychologist in the room. This is part of the disease. You get very obsessed, you get very depressed. But the older guys probably know this. but You get obsessed, you get depressed. Warn them. This is going to happen when you get obsessed. This is what you're going to do. And then we work on the techniques to stop the obsession. <coughs> Stress is felt after the event. Stress during an event is more of an excuse. Stress after the event is when you have to really worry about it. So for example, say you're speaking in front of a group of people. It's the stress afterwards, the stress after you stop speaking. That's going to be the most dangerous kind of stress. Heart attacks occur more likely after stressful events. We don't even have to talk about what happens after shootings and so forth. The stress after the events. It's the stress after the events. Generally, people who are stressed out become very focused, get that sort of tunnel vision. It's the stress that occurs after the event that leads mostly to relapse. You tell people they have to move forward, not just stop drinking. Now you all have known the people that go to rehab and they start having their meetings on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday nights, and basically they go into stagnation. You know, encourage them to go to different meetings, encourage them to go to different times, uh, make sure they have a home group, but encourage different types of experiences for them. And this all goes back to the three philosophies. Stagnation, collapse, and revitalization. Keep them in, embedded in, in consciousness, reflective consciousness. Number seven, stay in quadrant two. We talked about the quadrants. Stay in quadrant two. This is a perfect time to teach them. If you haven't worked with a person before, teach them the time management matrix. Teach them what quadrant two is. Teach them what that really means. The big thing they teach in rehabs is that people serve as uh, cues for drinking. They don't teach you that sometimes people serve as excuses for drinking. The people that accuse, they end up getting rid of, taking out of their life. The people that serve excuses are generally husbands or wives, 
children, in-laws, because they start saying, oh, I can't, I can't stand being around them, I want to drink. Don't let them get into that habit. And finally, teach them not to get rigid in recovery. You can tell a recovery addict when uh, you start talking to them, all he's talking about is recovery. All he starts talking about is spewing back AA philosophies. Teach them to have fun. You know, it's a lifestyle change to stop drinking. Teach them to have fun.